Good evening and welcome to the University of York and specifically to our online event series. My name is Joan Concannon and I'm Director of External Relations here at the University. Welcome to Behind the Scenes. This has been developed and designed in partnership with our student union. And I'm especially thrilled and delighted that Senor Tuma, who is our student uh, director of the Norman Ray Art Gallery here at the university, is here to wrap up this evening's event later on. So thank you for attending tonight. Um, a few technical notes before we get started. If you're watching live, you can ask questions using the Q&A button on your screen. This is available throughout the event, so questions can be asked at any time. If you have technical issues, such as a loss of Wi-Fi, you can rejoin the event using the original link on your ticket. Please also remember that today's event is being recorded, so you will be able to watch again and you can certainly share that with your friends as well. Subtitles are available for the event. To turn these on or off, use the CC Live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. So this series is part of our York Ideas platform of online events. As a university for public good, we are passionately committed to engaging with as many of you and as many different audiences as possible. We often encourage our students at the University of York to try something new. So, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> we often um, encourage our students at the University of York to try something new, and we hope very much that this series will enable you to experience something new and that you enjoy the journey with us. In this time of lockdown, we really want to provide additional education and ent entertainment. And Behind the Scenes aims to do just what it says on the tin. We want to give you the opportunity to explore the professions and industries which are sometimes less um, and the jobs within those that are sometimes less visible to the public to give you an insight into areas that you might never have imagined and thought about. I'm especially delighted to, that tonight's event explores the absolutely fascinating world of museums and galleries and specifically celebrates one of my favourite museums, the V&A. And if anything is going to remind us of just how important the arts and cultural, cultural organisations in this country are to the health of our society. Too often the social value of arts and humanities, education and the creative industries is not celebrated nearly enough. We need to think about it not only in terms of its contribution to our economy, huge though it is, but even more importantly and especially in a post-COVID world or a nearly soon to be post-COVID world, to think about the relationship between the arts and cultural organizations and our broader social and societal and health and well-being. So it's the most enormous pleasure to welcome Dr. Joanna Norman, Director of Research at the VNA, to have a conversation with my equally amazing colleague, Michael White from our History of Art Department. I especially want to personally thank Jo for her stalwart support for the York Festival of Ideas over the years. Jo has been facilitator in chief of just the most extraordinary cast list of curators from the VNA who have regularly spoken at the festival, and she's been a wonderful support. And now over to Michael to introduce Jo and get on with the evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Joan, for those uh, for those lovely uh, comments. So I'm absolutely delighted um, to be able to introduce uh, Joanna Norman uh, this evening, director of the VNA Research Institute. Uh, Joe began her career at the British Museum in the Prints and Drawings uh, Department before joining the the VNA in 2005. After which she's worked on a number of major projects there, including the enormous and and, and brilliant uh, Baroque exhibition of 2009. And then uh, also the redesign of the early modern European uh, galleries. She also uh, researched and managed the uh, collaboration between BBC Four and, and the VA on the TV series Handmade in Britain. And then very recently was uh, lead curator on the Scottish design galleries, the VA Dundee. And we might actually talk uh, about the extension of the VA into all kinds of other uh, places uh, later. Um, so in a moment, I'm going to hand over uh, to Joe, who's going to give a, a short presentation before we start the Q&A. So I've got a fantastic audience uh, tonight. Just to let you know, your, your, your numbers are in, in, you know, beyond 300 people. And we want to hear from you, so we'll try and, and, and manage your, your questions. Please do uh, put, put questions in and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll try and, and uh, find our way through it. But we've got lots and lots to talk about uh, before then uh, asking Sonar to give us some reflection at the end. So now I'll, I will hand over uh, to Joe to start uh, us off. 
Thank you uh, very much, Joan and Michael, for that uh, very kind introduction. And it's, it's an absolute pleasure um, to be here, uh, be well, be at home, of course, um, but be with you um, this evening. Um, I thought that it might be helpful. I'm sure some of you will know the VNA very well, um, but for the benefit of those who are perhaps less familiar with it, I thought I would just um, start off by um, really giving just a, an introduction to behind the scenes. And I have to say, this is also an excuse to share with you some images of the museum, which uh, I certainly am very much missing and have been um, for some time. So I'm just going to, to start, um, if I can share my screen, uh, which I hope you can see. Um, I'm just gonna start by, by saying a little bit about the VNA where it came from, what's I think particular about it, um, and some of the things that we're focused on uh, at the moment and that particularly um, relate to, to my role, which hopefully will provide some, um, some points for discussion as we, we go through the evening. So the first thing to say, I think, about the v &A is that it is a very particular kind of museum um, formed in quite particular circumstances. Oh, sorry, I am... Um... Just uh, trying to work out how to go forward. There we are. Um, and it's, I think if we if we think about a lot of museums, um, particularly perhaps in, in continental Europe, um, a lot of them evolved through what one might um that one might see as, as proto-museums of sort of princely, royal, aristocratic um, collections, cabinets of curiosity, Wunderkammer, Kunstkammer, as they're, they're often called, um, individual collections or family collections. And the v &A is not like that, um, because the v &A emerged through a very, very specific set of circumstances in the middle of the 19th century. And that was a real um, perception among uh, government and among design educators um, that uh, Britain was really not producing uh, very high quality goods. They might be well made, but they weren't well designed. Um, and so that was the spur really for the Great Exhibition of 1851, which took place in Hyde Park and attracted a phenomenal number of visitors to it uh, in the six months that it was on. And it really, it brought together supposedly the, wor the works of all nations and everything from raw materials through to uh, manufacturing processes, uh, examples of um, machinery, and of course, highly designed um, finished goods. And the exhibition was so popular uh, that it generated a huge amount of profit. Um, and it was those profits that really enabled then a, a lasting um, legacy to be created in what is now the area around South Kensington in London, um, which it has often been termed Albertopolis after Prince Albert, who was really the, um, the prime mover behind it. And Albertopolis was, um, was very much a combination of educational establishments and cultural organisations. So it was a mix. And we can still see that today. Um, if you think about the fact that uh, Imperial College is there uh, teaching the sciences, the Royal College of Art, the Royal College of Music, and then you have the v &A and now the Science Museum and the Natural History Museum. So those institutions were very much all founded in the same, well, apart from the Science Museum, which I'll mention in a moment, um, but the, there was a sense in which this, this cultural complex, cultural educational complex, came into being um, in one go, and that those connections between culture and education were absolutely key to how we need to think about the VNA. It's also important to say that uh, although what we find now in the VNA tends to be uh, art design and performance, it wasn't always like that. It was very much art and science together and including some really quite esoteric um, collections. In the early decades of the v &A, you could find uh, a fishery, you could find um, an animal products uh, collection, and you could also find a waste products collection. So there was a real sense in which it was a sort of, um, it was really a, a quite eclectic combination uh, ranging from the fine art to the industrial, um, to the very mundane and thinking about all, every, all and everything uh, in between. 
the the reason that it was so eclectic and and what is so specific about the way that it was um created and what it was created to do goes back to that um that original uh, concern that was expressed and then addressed or sought to be addressed through the great exhibition and it was all about improving the quality of design in british industry in british manufacturing and the way that that was done was twofold it was through the collection and display of uh, examples uh, and those were both positive and negative examples there was in fact a um a display that was uh, that was arranged in the early decades uh, of the V&A's life, um, which was known as the, it was called officially the Gallery of False Principles. And it was basically an exhibition of uh, negative exemplars. So, you know, do not do this. This is wrong because. Um, and it became uh, popularly known as the Chamber of Horrors. Um, so it was a, a collecting of of examples, uh, both historic and contemporary. Um, but then also the education was absolutely fundamental to it. Originally, the Royal College of Art was part of the museum um, so that the students could learn from the collections uh, and could copy the collections. Um, and the intention was very much that they were being trained, not really as artists, but as designers who would then go into commercial uh, industrial um, roles. So it was a very directed um, uh, museum and I think that that triangle of collections uh, education and contemporary practice is absolutely key uh, to understanding um, what it was all about the second thing um, that I think is is worth mentioning that it was it, it had a very um, a very clear remit that it was to make art accessible to all and it did that in two key ways one was to adopt a number of really quite pioneering um, technologies in order to build up collections of reproductions uh, and bring to South Kensington what could not be um, uh, what people what perhaps people couldn't see uh, if they were unable to travel, which, of course, uh, the, the vast majority of the population were not able to do. So here uh, you can see, for example, the enormous plaster cast in two halves of Trajan's column. Um, a monument that you would normally see uh, in Rome. And plaster casting was one technique that was used, photography was another, and the v &A was, I think, the first um, museum not only to uh, organise an exhibition of photography, but to employ the first uh, museum photographer. So there's a real sense of using technology um, in order to, to bring the world uh, to London. But also, the way that the museum was organised and, um, and arranged and operated was very much intended to open it up um, to a wider selection of members of the public than, uh, than was the case with perhaps other museums. Um, and that included creating the first uh, museum cafe. So you can see here there's a picture of what we now call the refreshment rooms. Um, which and, and the museum was open in the evening so that working people could come um, after their working day to, uh, to explore the museum and then take refreshment in, in this room. And it's also worth pointing out that that, um, that use of technologies is also applied in some of these parts of the museum. You can see here that it's covered in uh, glazed painted tiles and those were produced by uh, Minton the British firm. But of course, they were incredibly uh, practical because uh, because they were easy to wipe down. And there's all sorts of interesting bits of technology that you can find in the building um, that were, again, this kind of symbiosis between uh, what we would now call the creative industries uh, and the museum um, as it exists. So fast forward from the 1850s, uh, but keep that, uh, that sense of that, that triangle, those interconnections um, in your mind. And I think trying to encapsulate what the v &A is about now is, um, is difficult because in many ways it's, it's many different things to many different people. And that eclecticism, while perhaps we don't have a fishery anymore, I think still remains uh, in how we, um, in the appeal that we have to, uh, to different, uh, you know, many different members of the public for different reasons. So I'm showing you here um, uh, an image from one of our more recent exhibitions, which was uh, a very successful uh, exhibition of the fashion designer Christian Dior. And that is definitely something that we're very 
uh, well known for and our, our temporary exhibitions program includes um, a wide range of subjects from uh, a lot of fashion, a lot of performance, um, for example, David Bowie uh, or Pink Floyd, but also um, historical subjects like medieval embroidery uh, or the, the exhibition that we will open when we uh, are allowed to open again, uh, which will be about um, the art of Iran. So, um, so it's very varied within that program. But there are many people who don't come for our exhibitions. They come for very different things. Um, and this is just a, a snapshot of some of those. So, of course, we have very um, regular uh, learning programmes, working with uh, learners of, of all ages um, uh, in the museum and, and remotely, of course, now. We have a lot of contemporary programming, whether that's to do with um, our regular Friday Late series, uh, we, where we often have takeovers within the museum, or London Design Festival, where, um, as you can see in the middle, uh, that's one example of an installation within um, the museum's tapestry gallery. And then, of course, there is the studious research led um, aspect of the museum. Um, our collections, which now number around or over, I think, two, two and a half million objects, are the most amazing research resource. And there remains a huge amount that we don't know about them. And of course, there are myriad ways in which we can look at them and reinterpret them. And we also have the National Art Library, which is um, a really fantastic collection of uh, special, special collections, but also uh, an important art and design reference library. So this just gives you um, a sort of summary of some of the collections um, that, uh, that we hold and uh, that we make available. My role um, is really, um, is, is focused on, the many different aspects of research um, that being in a museum involves, uh, and I'm giving you just, um, just some of those here. Research takes many forms in the museum. Um, it's different from in a university because it just about always has an application that is seen or experienced by uh, some of those different audiences um, that we work with. Uh, and, and I guess it's, it, it is very varied and it's undertaken by quite a wide variety of people. It could be historical, scientific, uh, information science led, it can be practice led or practice based, uh, it can involve action research, working with communities, and it takes many different forms. Um, most obviously, it can be seen in our galleries, uh, in our exhibitions, in our books and so on. Um, and uh, alongside our temporary exhibitions, uh, for the last 20 years or so, we have gradually been updating, refurbishing, rethinking um, our permanent collections throughout the, um, the South Kensington estate. Uh, and I'm showing you here the uh, photography centre, which opened a couple of years ago. Um, to house or to display part of um, the collections of the Royal Photographic um, Society, which were transferred to us from Bradford uh, a few years ago on top of uh, our existing um, collections. So this and th this programme, I think, is worth mentioning because it's really created a kind of um, engine of activity uh, that has been focused on really you know delving into the collections seeking to find out more about what we the areas that we really don't know but also rethinking the narratives that we tell uh, in relation to those uh, collections and through those um, collections so we are uh, so this is uh, at south kensington but the moment that we're at now is a really interesting one um not least because of the impacts of covid and how we actually really think about what being a museum is in a COVID period and then as we recover from it. What is it? What do we need to be? What use do we serve? And who are we serving? Um, but also in the v as perspective, there's something really interesting going on anyway, which is about expanding from something that is so rooted in South Kensington and so much of that Albertopolis complex that I mentioned, but also, and shifting from that into something that still feels rooted there, but becomes more like a family of sites. Um, and that entails both uh, the you know, collections, the world of Wedgwood collections that now form part of the VNA, uh, VNA Dundee, which Michael mentioned earlier, and then uh, the Museum of Childhood in Bethnal Green and two new sites that we're developing in East London uh, on the Olympic Park, uh, the, a, a new museum. Uh, of which you can see a, a render, and then a new open collections and research centre, which will really be 
in in many ways the heart of uh, of our uh, research engine if you like and a space for experimentation a space for collaboration and a space for really exposing uh, the workings of the museum and sharing that much more openly um, than we have been able to do before so that's all I wanted to um, to start off with uh, and I think ending there is probably a good moment because uh, I hope that it will have given us uh, lots of points to talk about so I'm going to stop sharing now. Right, so, so I'm going to join uh, you again, um, Joanna. Thank you very much for that. Um, it's a really, really helpful overview of, of, of where the, the museum has you know, originates from and, and also where, where it's going. Um, obviously, we want to focus uh, quite a bit in this discussion on, on, on what it's like to kind of work in, in, in such an organisation. Perhaps we can talk a little bit at the beginning about um, your, your route to your current position was a curatorial uh, route. And the word kind of curator has come, become a bit more familiar uh, to, to people uh, over the years. And now the verb to curate is being extended to all kinds of things. But perhaps maybe we can talk a little bit about, about um, uh, what a curator actually does. Because uh, as, as Joe mentioned at the beginning, a lot of these roles are really quite in, in, invisible. And often it's only the very, very sort of public face of kind of exhibition making that might at all um, make people aware of curators. But, Perhaps give us, could you give us a sense of of, of the the multiplicity of, of, of the role of curator, in particular in a in a museum such as the VNA? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think I think it's worth saying. Just Joan's introduction reminded me that um, I mean, I got into this in the first place. Um, it, it's sort of by chance, in the sense that I was doing a. Um, I was doing postgraduate study at the Warburg Institute. I was doing a master's uh, there. And there was a certain point where I realised that academia was not the route that I wanted to go down and museums seemed to be a really good alternative. Now, I have to say that was probably thought without actually much understanding of what working in a museum entailed, other than the fact that I thought it probably involved doing research, but doing it perhaps with more um, public outputs than, uh, than perhaps might be possible uh, working in academia. So, and I think that... that um, uh, that opacity is is definitely um, is definitely true, and it's something that we're very aware of. So, being a curator, I think the the first thing to say is that it there are numerous uh, aspects of what that that word involves and what that job involves, and it very much um, varies according to the size and scale of of the institution. I think if you're in somewhere small, you would find yourself doing pretty much everything. Um, whereas if you're in a large institution like the VNA, it's a much more specialised um, role because we're we're fortunate in having far more curators who who are able to specialise in different things. But I always think it's um, it's worth remembering where the word comes from and that that it comes from curare to to look after. So the public facing bit is actually much less uh, in many ways what people see as core curatorial work. Um, and I think many people would see the core curatorial work as looking after the objects, understanding the objects and really developing that. Um, when I say looking after, what I mean is is understanding how best to, to care for them, keep them uh, for the future, but understanding the many, many different aspects of them. So the, the many lives that those objects have had before they've come into museums, the many different narratives that, uh, that they can be used to tell, um, and then and communicating that and communicating that in a range of ways, um, whether it's uh, answering inquiries from the public or it's uh, doing exhibitions or it's talks uh, or it's writing books or blog posts or whatever. But that it, it's very much about, you know, developing that knowledge that is object based and a, a real you know close looking and close understanding of those objects um, and then sharing that uh, in different forms for, for different people. Yeah, great. So we've had uh, uh, one, one question come in that may may sort of link to that in a little way, which is um, about um, how the decisions are made about about what exhibition stuff. So, so you've obviously got the permanent collections and then you've got temporary exhibitions. How is that exhibition uh, pro programming uh, decided? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So the way that it works with us is that uh, we have an exhibition steering group. 
um, which meets monthly. And that includes a number of the different, um, the kind of key stakeholders, if you like. Um, so in addition to, uh, to research and curatorial representation, there's obviously also finance uh, who are represented, but also audiences and design and learning. So you can imagine that there are... Um, Everybody, there are, there are many different stakeholders. Um, and what we look at is the, the spaces that we have, because we have about, we have three or four different spaces that we program with temporary exhibitions. Um, some are smaller than others, some are more suitable for certain types of exhibitions. And so what we're always aiming for is a program that is balanced, balanced uh, in terms of history, in terms of geography, in terms of type of subject. So we wouldn't want to program three fashion exhibitions at the same time as each other. Um, and that is seeking to appease thing over the course of a year, we might be looking over the course of three years um, or five years. Uh, so, you know, really looking um, at, at the balance and the sort of what we think is, is and, and of course, looking at it alongside what's going on elsewhere in uh, in London, um, other exhibitions that are coming up um, and uh, navigating all those different uh, interests. Mm, absolutely. So, well, I just, I mean, it might be worth just a little quick, quick mention of, of, of what the current interruption to activity might have done to that very kind of careful programming. You must have had a really, really tough year sort of rescheduling things and then rescheduling them again and then, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, um, I mean, it's been very interesting because um, I think people often think of national museums as like, um, I don't know, tankers, that they're, they're not able to move very quickly. And actually, I think we've all been surprised by everyone's ability, I mean, enforced ability to, to pivot, as we are now saying, um, and to adapt to changing circumstances. And it, it's been frustrating because... For example, we did a, a call out last year for um, for rainbows um, that children had made, uh, and we for the in relation to the museum museum of childhood, and we collected a fantastic array and put on a display of them. But then we were closed again, so I think the display was only up for about three or four weeks when we had hoped that it would be up for three or four months. So yes, I mean we we have done a lot of planning and replanning, um, and obviously you know now we're, we're glad that we will be opening again in in May hopefully, um, and that that has forced uh, again um, you know renewed planning. But I think also a lot of institutions have been thinking about the models of exhibitions um, that tend to rely very heavily on international loans. Uh, which have also been um, been very difficult with uh, with COVID. So I think that there's been a bit of um, sort of rethinking and uh, really interrogating what our program is for. And at the moment, because we're still in the middle of all of it, I think it's too early to see to say what things are likely to change fundamentally mm -hmm. uh, and what what is likely to return to um, to something approaching pre-COVID normality. But it's been, objectively, it's been very interesting. Subjectively, it's been incredibly frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's some quite interesting questions coming in, uh, actually, about, um, uh, you know, the kind of switch to, to online and so forth, which we might come, come to in, in, in a moment, perhaps. But just before we, we get there, um, was, you presented very interestingly, but just I, ha I hadn't realised how many national collections are housed within the I knew the kind of collection as a whole and there's certain bits of it that I knew about hadn't appreciated just how many sort of designated national collections there are there you just mentioned this potential specialisms of, of curators can you give us a sense of the, the scale of the numbers of people who work within uh, the VNA and how many people you are interacting with at, a, at any particular time yes so we have um well, the total staff um, has been about uh, a thousand, I think just, just under a thousand. So we're, we're pretty big, not quite as big as the, the British Museum, but, um, but I think not, probably not far off. In terms of curatorial staff, um, I think that's been about sort of 150. So very large in comparison with many institutions. And we're well aware of, of that, that that makes us you know, very fortunate uh, in many ways. And our, our departments are divided up by, uh, apart from the Asia department, which is the only curatorial department which is designated by geography. 
all the others are arranged by uh, by material. So, and that has always been one of the things about the the V&A is the um, the focus on ceramics or metalwork or fashion and textiles. Um, and uh, and so, I suppose in my day to day work, I come across and you know people from all of those different areas, depending on what we're focusing on um, at the moment. But it's. Um, uh, and then, of course, that's that's without even talking about conservators and scientists and colleagues in learning uh, and marketing and so on. So it's very, very varied. And that's only internally. Um, and a lot of my work is really acting as a, a kind of bridge between the museum and university partners. So there are a lot of it's it's like a, a sort of the central point within two fans, if you like. It's a sort of internal network and then the external network, um, some of which connect and then some of which where we're really, I and my team, which is, is very small, um, are bridging those relationships and helping to build them, particularly uh, between colleagues in the museum who are working on uh, certain areas and then matching those often or, or connecting them with colleagues uh, in the university or, or in uh, the creative industries. Yeah. So, I mean, given given the the interest, of, you know, in particular kind of materials and practices, and you and you you spoke about um, you know the 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 VNA actually as a as a as a whole kind of machine for tra- training designers and, and and so forth. There must be, um, you know, your route in was through a certain kind of academic route and engagement with with, with art history. But there must be people coming in from various kind of practice based uh, uh, courses from all actually a range of disciplines. Uh, to make up that whole uh, array of people. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's one of the things that um, that I have always found really stimulating about working there. Um, I don't know whether it's more the case with the v than it is with some other museums, but I've, I've, I've always had that impression. But yes, we have a, we have quite I have quite a lot of colleagues who've come in from fine art um, background or a practice background, say, as uh, jewellery designers or photographers. And in fact, quite a lot who continue to have uh, some kind of artistic practice or design practice, um, as well as their uh, their museum work. I think the, the other thing that I, I've noticed, um, I think particularly in recent years, is um, colleagues who are coming in with a background in festivals or um, biennials or journalism um, as well, actually. I think the the lines are much more fluid than they used to be. Uh, and I think actually that's often very positive because it brings different approaches in and it means that you, you, you know, you're getting new ideas coming in about how to do things as well as about subject expertise. Mm. Great. Now, just to shift some of the say, we've got lots of really interesting uh, questions coming up and, and just going back to what we are talking about a moment ago about the museum being closed or, or at least being physically closed, but actually very open still uh, on online and actually putting a lot of uh, content on, on online. I've got a question really, which is about uh, whether that's going to kind of continue and about uh, I know access to the museum, you know, digitally as well as, as physically. Can you tell us something about the, the plans the museum has in that area? Yeah, so um, I mean, it's it's interesting because I think my my colleagues who work in digital would always say that they they regard the visits to the the V&A's digital outputs as you know complementary to but uh, self standing. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not just a kind of subservient thing to uh, to the physical visit to the museum. And I think we, like just about everybody else, have learned an awful lot about the benefits of opening up um, more of our content and engaging much more actively um, digitally. So I find it very difficult to see that we would return to a scenario where, for example, with events, we would only do them in person. I mean, that seems mad because we've all benefited from opening up our the events that w- whether we've been leading them or whether we've attended them um, in the last year, there's been the most fantastic international connections that have been opened up. And it's obviously, it, you know, it's much more it's much more open. It's much more inclusive if we're um, if we're able to to offer things to a much wider audience, much larger audience than we would be able to fit in uh, the V&A's lecture theatre, for example. So, so I think um, I think certainly from the point of view of um, you know if, things like events of all kinds, whether it's it's talks or it's curator tours, for example, uh, we had a really successful 
um, uh, curator tour of our kimono exhibition, which um, which went out after that was closed with the first lockdown. And, and it was fantastic because it gave that sense of uh, the curator really taking people around in a way that normally wouldn't there wouldn't be that many people who would be able to have that kind of experience. So I think many of these things will become much more embedded and uh, we will be doing them routinely um, in a way that perhaps we had talked about before, but we hadn't actually really done it. Um, I think there's still an awful lot for us to learn because the the skills and the capacity and the the how long it takes to produce really, really good quality digital content. It's, they're different things. They're different kinds of things from just um, creating, you know, a, a physical experience. So I think we have to be careful not to just assume that we can create a kind of digital version, if you like, uh, um, of the sorts of experiences that you have in person. I think it's a different thing. Um, but I think we, yeah, it will definitely be part of, of everything that we do. Um, and it's also worth saying that um, this long predates COVID, but uh, but has seen its realisation just in the last couple of weeks that um, we have, are, like many museums, of course, we have a what used to be called Search the Collections um, online, which is our, our online database, essentially. And we've just we've spent the last, I'm not sure how long, a couple of years, I think, redesigning that. Uh, and it launched in its beta version a couple of weeks ago. So Explore the Collections makes over a million objects um, accessible much more intuitively um, than it was uh, than it was before, and uh, with much much better connections between different kinds of content that are associated with those objects. So there's lots of different levels, I think, and different layers of content. Um, and I think one of the things that we will be looking at uh, is really it's always who who is the audience, what is the audience, and therefore what is the right content, what is the right form of delivery, and what can we how can we best use digital experiences and how can we best use the in-person experience um, so that, you know, that it's not a case of comp competing, um, but serving, doing different things. Brilliant. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, yeah, I'm sure we're going to be talk all talking loads more about, about this in the next years as we're, we're all engaged in very much the same sort of thinking process and very, very similar. It's interesting to see some of, some of the questions um, in relation to the, the different VNA sites and and, uh, and and people's awareness of them or or, or not, interestingly. Um, so, could you tell us a little bit about? Um, so, you worked uh, you know very specifically on on uh, uh, VNA Dundee, but also in relation to uh, VNA East, the, the sort of different ambitions for those those sites, the different things you might be doing uh, in them, and in relation to to the sort of um, uh, uh, reaching different audiences that you've just described. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because um, they're all quite different and they've all come out of quite different circumstances, actually. So v Dundee is, it, it wasn't a case of the v deciding it was going to create a new museum outside London and or in Scotland and, and going to Dundee. It was actually, it was an approach from Dundee um, to the v &A, and it was part of a big um, city regeneration um, programme. It's a really interesting model because although it's called VNA Dundee, it is actually a five-way partnership in which the VNA is only one of those partners. So it's the VNA, Dundee City Council, the two universities in Dundee, uh, and then Scottish Enterprise, which is kind of jobs creation um, body. So it's really interesting because it's at the it's essentially they decided to put culture at the heart of this city regeneration plan. Um, and the because it because Dundee is such a um it was a, a, I mean, it's it's like many uh, port cities uh, in the UK. It was a real, um, it was a hive of industry. It had very particular industries, you know, textiles, shipbuilding, um, journalism, uh, and printing. Um, and it was particularly, particularly made its fortune um, during uh, through the British Empire, um, and has so in the twentieth century, like many uh, post uh, imperial and post industrial cities, 
um, it had uh, really suffered quite severe levels of, of deprivation. So it's a the, the city regeneration context was very, very specific to, um, to Dundee. And therefore, it has a very uh, local and then regional and national and nationalist in Scotland um, remit uh, to uh, as a centre for design creativity, um, which feels very much in tune with uh, with the, the V&A uh, and, and its overarching mission. So that that's Dundee. v and East um, has uh, come out of um, two things, really. One is the legacy of the Olympics, uh, the cultural legacy and the regeneration of that part of London. Um, and uh, so the museum, for example, which is within the Olympic Park, will be uh, just next to London College of Fashion, uh, next to a new Sadler's Wells um, Centre and new housing as well. So it's part, again, of a new um, kind of cultural educational complex. And then the second thing is that um, we have we needed to find a new home for our stored collections, basically, and we wanted to do it in an open way. We've had for the last few years, um, you know, study rooms for our archives and for our uh, the Cloth Workers Centre for the study of textiles and fashion, which is open by appointment. But for other parts of the collection, they were really badly served, and they were they've been housed in uh, what is a rather wonderful building, but it's a nineteenth century. Um, uh, building that was not not intended for as a big open store. So really, that VNA East gives us um, gives us an opportunity to uh, to really create something that um, that will do what we we hope is is needed. But again, you know that that we have to be rooted in that particular part of London, in those four boroughs, in the the demographic uh, very different demographics from London and we expect very different visitors because um in South Kensington pre-covid we were getting we probably had about 50 percent uh, of our visitors were tourists international tourists and in Stratford we expect and we hope that it will be a much more um local audience so it's a very different kind of um very different kind of thing but with connections that we want to um draw between the different sites so that you know they speak to each other but complement each other great fantastic now You've mentioned um, London College of Fashion there and textiles and across We've got some questions that relate actually to the uh, fashion exhibitions. And I know that um, you know, quite a few museums have, have, have moved into this, this area as a way of, of, of um, um, attracting different audiences. And, and this is obviously something that's been um, you know, very much part of you know, in, the, in the, the DNA of the VNA for a very, very long time. So it's a, a couple of related questions. Someone's asked very specifically about the Christian Dior exhibition, just um, how many of those objects might have been in the collections, how many were, were loaned, and someone's also just asked about the impact of the Alexander McQueen exhibition as well. So maybe we could tie this together into something actually about the place of fashion and clothing design and so forth in the in the V&A uh, over many, many uh, years. Um, You've got some comment yeah. on that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I should say that that's absolutely not my area of expertise, but um, but uh, yeah, both of those I think have been hugely influential um, exhibitions. And in fact, I mean, Dior, the majority of it was loans. Um, and in fact, the exhibition had been shown in a slightly different form in Paris before it came to the V&A. But we um, expanded it and included a, a, quite a large number of, um, of objects from the V&A's uh, collections. So, and that formed a new, a whole new part of the exhibition that was focused on Dior and Britain. Um, with McQueen, one of the interesting things about him is that he used to come to the V&A to study the uh, objects in our collection, and his interest in the V&A absolutely—I mean, you can see it in numerous collections um, over the course of, of his career. And I think that's what's really interesting and um, perhaps characteristic about textiles and fashion within the V&A, that it's not just about um, showcasing an important designer. It's about the fact that often those designers um, have used the V&A's collections and mined the V&A's collections because of that long history of, of including fashion within um, art and design. And that we, a lot of our you know, the people who come and make appointments at the Cloth Workers Centre, 
um, they're not all historians. They are often um, their fashion designers or their fashion students and so on. So I think that that continuity is really, really um, important. And I think it's also important to say that um, while there are um, big name exhibitions like McQueen and Dior, a lot of our fashion exhibitions are not big names uh, and they much more heavily draw from the, the v as permanent collection. So, I mean, one, for example, um, which I thought was was one of the most interesting exhibitions that we, we've done in recent years was Fashion from Nature, which was all about the relationship between the fashion industry and the natural world going back a, a good couple of hundred years. Um, and that had some fascinating examples, um, garments and textiles from within our own collection, um, as well as quite a lot of contemporary pieces uh, and, and in fact involved some student work as well. So I think it's that continuity that is really characteristic. Yeah, brilliant. Well, that that, uh, that really high, highlights something you said right at the beginning about the, the ed, you know, broad educational mission of the of the museum from, from its from its founding. And the fact that you know, some people might might be visiting because they, you know, they, for a, let's call it a sort of leisure or entertainment purpose. Others, I mean, you, I was nice to see an image of the National Art Library where I spent many, many, many hours uh, in, in, in the past. But you never can really tell what people are coming for, and it, and it, they can look like they've come for a cup of tea and are just wander around, but they actually might be engaged in some quite kind of serious research. Actually, as just as as as, as ordinary. Uh, uh, visitors. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that's um, that that's one of the things that makes it interesting, uh, and the fact that quite often, you know, as you, I mean, I always find it fascinating because when I tell people that I work at the VNA, the the responses are often either, oh, I don't really understand what the VNA is. Does it, you know, is it all Victorian? Or, oh, I love the v and I love, and the, and then a very very specific example, but those examples are very very varied. Um, and I think that's one of the, the brilliant things about it. Yeah. Well, just as we as we um, uh, you know, start start to sort of wrap this up, actually, someone's asked a question that actually springs a little from that, but and sort of turns it a bit around to you, which is actually about whether you've got a favourite object. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, I do, and it's really weird. Um, so, <laughs> so in uh, so I'm I work principally on. Um, when I get to do my own research, um, it's on 17th century Italy and France, and uh, and I do quite a lot on on architectural um, interiors, which tend to be known as period rooms within the museum. So I've actually got two objects. One is a room that um, used to be originally in a seven, mid, late 17th century French um, chateau, and the reason I love it is because, well, partly intellectually, because there's there's still quite a lot that I haven't quite worked out um, about it in terms of its history and its, in terms of its um, it, how much it's been taken apart and put back together again, which is, is often something that happens with museum objects. But secondly, because the sensory experience that it gives you as a room within a museum is um, there's something about that that I find really, really interesting. The whole experience, the kind of embodied experience of the museum, which is, of course, what we've been missing for most of the last year, um, is something that is is part of what what keeps me interested about it and the way that different people experience those spaces and the smells and the sounds um, of the museum as well as just looking it's it's not all about sight it's it's about all of the senses and this room just encapsulates that because the smell is different the sound is much deader um the uh you know the light is dark I know that didn't really make sense but you know it's <laughs> so it's a, it's a real kind of immersed it's being immersed in in an object basically which which I love and then the second object that is is a real oddity it's um it's a very strange sculpture of an ox or rather an ox skin head and skin wrapped around a tree trunk uh, and it was produced in the late 17th century in Padua and it supposedly records the uh it was there's a, an account at the time of one of those Italian scientific academies of which there were quite a lot in the, the 17th century um undertaking a dissection of an ox and finding a kind of what they they described as a fossilized uh, sort of growth. Anyway, so this weird sculpture 
has a marble head. It's got the kind of flaps of skin opened up and then there's there's this sort of bony growth in its head. It sounds peculiar. And if you look it up online, it looks peculiar. Um, and But it's fascinating because it's all about the kind of that, that conjunction between art, design, medicine. Um, and it is also... We, when we were, we, it's in the the European 17, uh, 1600 to 1815 galleries, uh, and it's quite a prominent piece. When we were refurbishing those galleries a few years ago, obviously everything came out, and we redid the spaces and conserved everything. And it was absolutely filthy because loads of people have been walking past it and patting it on the nose as they went past. So it's it's that kind of thing where. Um, you know, there are so many different things about that individual object and the, it's absolutely impossible to convey that in the gallery setting where it has a 60 word label that uh, probably says something terribly serious, but but not all the other bits. <laughs> Fantastic. Great. Well, just just one final final one from me, from me which is so you mentioned the um, uh, 1600 to 1815 galleries. You've worked on some of these major uh, projects like the redesign of those spaces can you give us just a sense of the sort of time scales involved and I'm sure that that unfolded over a very long period of time yeah that one was um that was five years um which felt very short actually um when we did the the British galleries which predates me um which were the first was the first of these big um, these big projects that was 10 years I think medieval renaissance was eight so they're pretty extensive and that's that's because it's a combination of um, obviously the, the architectural uh, and design work, the conservation work, the um, the in-depth research into the collections, but also a lot of audience research um, and really, you know, a lot of consultation with different focus groups, academics, um, different audience groups. Um, so it's, yeah, it's an extended um, process and it's very much a collaborative effort. And I think that's, that's another of the things that is really important to stress about museum work that the yeah it's it's often frustrating when you see uh, uh the way that museum work is described because it's of, of, often seems as if it's a sort of lone genius curator and actually it's it's much more collaborative than that because everybody who is involved in these projects brings different skills and what works is when all of those skills are really working together um to produce something that is better than what any of those individuals could have produced on their own Brilliant. Well, that, to me, that, that sounds like a nice moment to uh, hand over to uh, Sanaa to, to kind of give us a bit of a summing up and her thoughts on, on what, what she's heard. Just from, from me, uh, to thank you enormously for all of that uh, insight. And, and uh, I mean, I, I like to think about myself as someone who knows a fair amount about the, the V&A, but I've learned a huge amount listening to you this, this evening. And um, a great tribute to actually to to everyone who works in in, in such an extraordinary uh, institution and so we're I along with lots of other people are really looking forward to being back there soon and also to seeing you uh, in person but now uh, for the moment let's hand over to Sanaa. Um, thank you so much Michael and Joanna um, for being our speaker and chair um, if anyone watching would like to see this again and share it with their friends and colleagues, the recording of this event will be available on the York Ideas YouTube channel, which can be accessed by typing York Ideas YouTube into Google. Um, but please allow a couple of days for it to appear. Um, I really enjoyed this talk and I feel that it offered a really unique perspective about the V&A. Um, while this may be a really challenging time for students to be entering the employment market, events like this really give a fascinating insight into what diverse range of careers there are um, and behind the scenes. Um, and I really hope that everyone will continue to engage with the upcoming behind the scenes events, which can be found on the york.ac.uk slash events website, um, together with a full listing of this term's open lectures. Um, yeah, I'd like to thank the speaker and chair again for being amazing. And thank you to the audience for joining us and have a nice evening. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure.